Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another Women's Health webinar series. And we are into part six, and we'll be discussing the thyroid hormones. And my name is Zoom Heaton, and I am the Women's Health Clinical Liaison. So we'll be reviewing the anatomy and physiology of the thyroid gland. We're going to be looking at functions of thyroid hormones, discuss signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperthyroidism. We're going to go over some autoimmune thyroid conditions, uh, Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. And I'm going to discuss the underlying functional potential causes of thyroid autoimmune conditions. We're going to discuss lab ranges, look at natural versus synthetic thyroid therapy. We're going to go over some compounded options with thyroid and the use of low-dose naltrexone and look at some side effects of thyroid replacement therapy. An estimated 27 million Americans have some form of thyroid disease, and up to 60% of those with thyroid disease are unaware. So most of them don't even know it. And it could be because thyroid problems are just overlooked or undetected due to a lack of proper screening or testing. And many people fall under the subclinical range where test results are quote unquote normal, but they continue to have symptoms. Women are five to eight times more likely than men to have thyroid problems. And that's really due to hormonal fluctuations over the course of their lives uh, with pregnancy, perimenopause, menopause. One woman in eight will develop a thyroid disorder during their lifetime. And more than 12% of the U.S. population will develop a thyroid condition in their lifetime. So just a little bit of history on the thyroid. The ancient Greeks named the thyroid thyreos, which means shield. And it was because of the shape of the gland that resembled a type of ancient Greek shield. An example of such a shield was engraved actually on a coin dating from 431 to 424 BC. And the first picture of the thyroid was actually provided by Leonardo da Vinci in 1500. Thomas Wharton in 1656 gave the gland its modern day name after the shape of an ancient Grecian shield. And in 1811, the French chemist Bernard Courtois discovered iodine. And it was Eugen Bauman in 1896 who had documented iodine as the central ingredient in the thyroid gland. And he did this by boiling the thyroid of a thousand sheep and named the precipitate, which is a combo of the thyroid hormones, iodothyrin. And in 1914, T4 or thyroxine was first isolated, and in 1927, it was synthesized. And in 1952, T3 or triodothyroxine was made. And then in 1970, the conversion of T4 to T3 was discovered. So we're going to do a little anatomy review of the thyroid. It is a small butterfly-shaped gland that is located at the bottom of the neck area where the collarbone and clavicles are. And it sits in front of your trachea or windpipe. and Below the larynx, which is your voice box, has a left and a right side with the connector called the isthmus. And of course, it is part of the endocrine system. It influences virtually every metabolic system in the body. So just something to keep in mind that there are thyroid receptors in virtually every cell in your body. So an imbalance of thyroid hormones can affect every metabolic function in your system. Okay, so we're going to look at how the thyroid works, and it starts in the brain with the hypothalamus, which is a cone-shaped structure that's located in the lower center of the brain communicating between the nervous and the endocrine systems, and it sends out TRH, which is thyroid-releasing hormone, to the pituitary. The pituitary sends out TSH, which is the thyroid-stimulating hormone, and TSH stimulates what is called thyroid peroxidase, which is the enzyme that uses iodine to create T4 and T3 in the thyroid gland. Now, the thyroid makes more T4 than it does T3. 93% of T4, 7% of T3. And once they're made, they hitch a ride on thyroid binding globulin, which is 
a binding protein that takes it through the bloodstream and then drops it off at target cells. But of course, T4 being inactive has to be converted to the active form T3. And about 60% of T4 is converted to T3 in the liver, and the remaining is converted to T3 in peripheral tissues. So about 20% is converted to inactive forms of T3, which is the T3 sulfate and the triiodothyroacetic acid. And they are converted into the active form of T3 in the gut by intestinal sulfatase. And that is created by healthy gut bacteria. And the other 20% goes to reverse T3, which is another inactive form of T3, which we will discuss later. So in order for the thyroid to maintain homeostasis, it has to go through a feedback loop. The hypothalamus and the pituitary both are very sensitive to thyroid hormone levels in the blood. So as the levels increase, the hypothalamus will detect and inhibit the release of TRH. Thus, there is less stimulation of the pituitary, and of course, then there's less TSH, hence there's less thyroid hormones that are produced. The inverse occurs when blood levels of thyroid hormones are reduced, the hypothalamus will stimulate the release of TRH, so it stimulates the pituitary, TSH is produced, and thus more thyroid hormones are made. Okay, so here we've got T4, T3, and the reverse T3 molecules, and just wanted to show the difference between the T3 and the reverse T3 molecules, even though they both have three iodine molecules. The difference is the missing deodinated iodine from the inner ring with reverse T3 here versus the missing iodine uh, molecule on the outer ring in T3, which would be here. So they're very similar, but different. So there are several types of thyroid hormones. We have TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, and it is made by the pituitary gland and the brain. And both hormones, T4 and T3, are activated by TSH. We also have T2, which is diodothyronine, and it's produced from T3 and reverse T3. And T2 increases the metabolic rate of muscles and fat tissues, and these levels decrease with age. We have T3, which is the byproduct of T4, and it is physiologically active. T4, or thyroxine, is made mostly by the thyroid gland, and the body only uses about 60% of it. Reverse T3 is another type of thyroid hormone. It is metabolically inactive. It only has 1% of the activity of T3, and it really is the antithesis of T3. So the higher reverse T3 levels, the lower T3 levels are. Higher levels of reverse T3 are usually seen with chronic stress, a major trauma, surgery, and of course the potential problem with reverse T3 is that it can bind to a cell the same way as T3 does, but of course nothing is happening. There's no activity with binding. And so T3 and reverse T3 can actually compete for receptors at the cellular level, which could be a problem because if it blocks those receptors, then T3 can't get in to work. And high reverse T3 is now known medically as reverse T3 dominance. And this is a chart comparison of thyroid hormone. T3 and T4. Potency-wise, T3 is four times more active than T4. And of course, T4 is the pro-hormone. It is less active. The thyroid only makes 7% of T3 versus 93% of T4. The half-life is important to know. T3 is only, a half-life is only one day. T4 is five to seven days. So that's kind of important to know when it comes to dosing. Storage, usually T4 has a higher affinity for, for proteins. So um, it's more bound than your T3. And there are no receptors for T4. So there are only receptors for T3. As far as conversion goes with T4, 60% is converted to T3 in the liver and 20% becomes active in the intestines only in the presence of healthy gut flora.
Let's talk about iodine. It is an essential trace mineral. It is not made by the body, so it has to be eaten or we have to take supplements for it. And iodine is needed, of course, to make thyroid hormones. It also has antibacterial, anti-cancer, antiviral, anti-parasitic, and mucolytic properties. So iodine is actually more beneficial than just needed to make thyroid hormones. And it's also uh, important in maintaining healthy breast tissue and nerve function. Of course, it protects against toxic effects from radioactive material. Some sources of iodine exposure. So we need about 150 mics of iodine per day. And in pregnant women, 200 mics is needed. And some of the common diet sources include iodized salt, kelp, bread, milk, and fish. But then there are other sources like topical iodine, medications like amiodarone, which is an antiarrhythmic drug, per 200 milligram tablet contains 75 grams of iodine. So that's a huge amount of iodine that we don't even normally think about. Other sources, topical iodine, expectorants, mouthwashes, and vaginal douches. So thyroid function is like a relay race. So the hormones passing the baton from the brain to the pituitary to thyroid gland to the liver and then to cells. And of course, at certain points, these hormones shed some weight by dropping a molecule of iodine before finishing the race. Thyroid is involved in basically all your major functioning of the body. And to get started, to have a healthy brain, appropriate thyroid functioning has to be there for glucose metabolism, synaptic transmission, cell migration, and proliferation. And if you have prolonged hypothyroidism, it can lead to neurological disorders like Alzheimer's disease, depression, autism. And thyroid is also involved in metabolism. It increases metabolic rate, bone formation and growth, metabolism of protein, carbohydrates, and lipids, and it stimulates mitochondrial replication and energy production within the mitochondria. So thyroid hormone affects every organ, tissue, and cell in your body. And some of those organ systems that thyroid hormone affects your eyes, it affects the function of the nerves and muscles, your lungs, it affects the breathing rate, and also your heart. It stimulates the heart rate and function. It affects the rate at which energy is used in digestion. It affects growth and development. Also, it affects the functioning of the reproductive system. And it is really common to have thyroid problems appearing at menopause. And keep in mind that your ovaries have thyroid receptors and the thyroid gland has ovarian receptors. So when we have hormonal losses of estrogen and testosterone from your ovaries that occur at menopause, it can really affect your thyroid. Some other functions of thyroid hormone. It modulates sexual function, regulates energy and heat production, regulates vitamin usage, it stimulates protein synthesis, affects tissue repair and development, controls oxygen utilization, regulates blood flow. And now let's talk about some factors that affect thyroid function. So nutritional deficiencies. Certain nutrients are critical as cofactors in thyroid production, and these include iron, iodine, tyrosine, zinc, selenium, vitamin E, B2, B3, B6, C, and D. And then there are factors that inhibit production of thyroid hormones, such as stress infection, trauma, radiation, medications, toxins like pesticides and heavy metals, autoimmune disease like celiac, fluoride. And there's also other factors that increase the conversion of T4 to reverse T3. And reverse T3, of course, is the inactive form of T3. And that includes stress, trauma, low-calorie diet, inflammation, toxins, infections, liver and kidneys being sluggish, certain medications. And then there are other factors that increase the conversion of T4 to T3, like selenium and zinc. And then we have factors that improve cellular sensitivity to thyroid hormones, like vitamin A, exercise, and zinc. So it looks like zinc is the common 
mineral that is vital for thyroid functioning. So there are many types of thyroid conditions. Of course, you have the underactive thyroid, hypothyroidism, the overactive hyperthyroidism. You have the autoimmune condition, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and also Graves' disease, which is another autoimmune condition. There's also goiter, where it's just a non-cancerous enlargement of the thyroid gland. Then there are also thyroid nodules, and they're just growths that form on or in your thyroid gland, and they are much more common in women than men. And then there is thyroid cancer, which there are four main types. So let's just get started with hypothyroidism. It is a condition where the thyroid is consistently underactive, and about five out of 100 Americans age 12 and older have hypothyroidism and women are affected much more than men and it is more common in people older than age 60. So we're going to look at the signs and symptoms of low thyroid production. The earliest signs and symptoms of low thyroid function can occur several years prior to lab results being normal. So you can actually have these signs and symptoms for quite a while before they're detected. So there is a myriad of symptoms of low thyroid. They include brain fog, memory loss, no energy, headaches, hair loss, large thyroid gland, insomnia, elevated cholesterol, constipation, muscle pain, depression, joint pain, dry skin, cold hands and feet, weight gain, menstrual irregularities, constipation, bloating, and these are very, very common in low thyroid. Some more signs and symptoms include fluid retention, poor circulation, slow speech, nails that are easily broken, poor night vision, puffy face, anxiety and panic attacks, reduced heart rate, tinnitus, iron deficiency, anemia. So some other signs and symptoms of low thyroid production include a hoarse husky voice, low blood pressure or hypertension, sparse coarse dry hair, yellowish discoloration of the skin, sleep apnea, endometriosis, fibrocystic breast, and they tend to have more allergic reactions and the loss of the latter one third of the eyebrows. And here there's still more signs and symptoms, B12 deficiency, nutritional imbalances, osteoporosis, easy bruising, shortness of breath, high C-reactive protein, arrhythmias, increased risk of developing asthma, and of course, eating disorders. So more signs and symptoms of low thyroid production. So a higher amount of insulin. Hypothyroidism can actually slow the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream and into cells. And it slows the response of insulin to elevated blood sugar. So glucose is slow to get into the cells to make energy. You have hypoglycemia, easy bruising, hyperhomocysteinemia, and of course, homocysteine is an amino acid that's involved in the methylation process impacting cognition, detoxification, and cardiovascular function. Impaired methylation can actually result in adverse changes to gene expression, which of course is uh, associated with autoimmunity cancer and early aging. So the beauty of hyperhomocysteinemia is that we can do something about that. Um, other signs and symptoms, gallstones, bladder and kidney infections, bipolar disorders, schizoid or affective disorders. There are several causes of hypothyroidism. It includes poor conversion from T4 to T3, a sluggish pituitary gland, too much thyroid binding proteins in the bloodstream, binding up hormones nutritional deficiencies, environmental thyroid disruptors, and immune dysfunction. So what are the factors affecting thyroid conversion? The first is stress. Chronic stress with excessive cortisol production literally will prevent the body from converting T4 to T3. It also decreases TSH production and increases the wrong thyroid hormone, which is reverse T3. Also, the deterioration of the body cell membranes in response to chronic infection or inflammation. So cell membranes are in charge of multiple functions, including the conversion of T4 and T3. And chronic inflammation causes lipid peroxidation in which harmful free radicals damage cell walls and, of course, damage cell walls, hamper 
thyroid conversion. Other factors include impaired liver function, and of course, the majority of the thyroid conversion occurs in the liver. So if there's dysfunction in the liver or if it's sluggish, conversion doesn't happen. Poor gut health, where you have dysbiosis, inflammatory bowel disease, and intestinal permeability, which we'll discuss further later. And low-calorie diets. So anytime there is strict restriction of calories, your body seems to want to redirect your thyroid hormone into the inactive version, which of course causes a drop in metabolism. And that's basically for just life preservation, and it's a protective mechanism for survival. So other factors affecting thyroid conversion is insufficient levels of 5-diiodinase levels. And 5-diiodinase enzymes are required for thyroid conversion. So they, are, they act like spark plugs to make this conversion. And there are three types of diiodinases. You've got D1, which is located in the thyroid, the liver, and the kidney, and it plays an important role in the production of T3. D2 is found in the pituitary, the hypothalamus, and brown fat, and it converts T4 to T3. D3 catalyzes deiodination of the inner ring of T4 and T3, which inactivates the hormone. And some factors affecting the 5 deiodinase enzyme production, too much estrogen, birth control pills, elevated cortisol, stress, decreased kidney or liver function, herbicides, pesticides, high carbohydrate diet, inadequate protein intake. You've got the heavy metals, your cadmium, mercury, or lead toxicity, chronic illness, selenium deficiency, and starvation. So other factors affecting thyroid conversion, of course, the aging process, inflammation, which is rampant, diabetes, calcium excess, copper excess, excessive alcohol intake, dioxins, fluoride, phthalates, surgery, and radiation. So medications can also affect thyroid conversion, and some of them include beta blockers, oral contraceptives, estrogen replacement, lithium, phenytoin, theophylline, chemotherapy, uh, glucocorticoids, interleukin-6, and of course, IL-6 is a cytokine that's made in response to pathogens and other antigens that regulate and mediate the inflammatory and immune response. And so an injection of a single dose of interleukin-6 can affect thyroid conversion and clomipramine. So another cause of hypothyroidism is a sluggish pituitary gland. So the thyroid gland may be perfectly fine, but since the pituitary is the air traffic controller. It's basically not telling it to work. And chronic stressors are at the root of this cause of hypothyroid. And cortisol fatigues the pituitary and it fails to signal the thyroid to release enough TSH to stimulate, it, to stimulate its activity. It is the result of one of three things. So the first is an active stress response. So basically that's your busy lifestyle, your poor diet, inadequate sleep, too much caffeine, high carb diet, chronic inflammation, viral or bacterial infections, basically wear out the adrenal glands and depress thyroid function. The next thing is postpartum depression. Pregnancy amplifies the demands of all hormonal systems. And of course, keeping the pituitary active and busy 24 seven, which of course overwhelms the pituitary gland and inappropriate use of thyroid medications. So medications could be flooding your system with unnecessary thyroid hormone. And of course their cells could develop resistance to it. And so be weary of being incessantly bombarded with too much thyroid hormone because the cells slam the door shut so no more can get in. When thyroid hormones can't get into the cells to regulate metabolism, hypothyroid symptoms return. And with an overabundance of thyroid hormone circulating in the bloodstream, the pituitary gets the message it's no longer needed and of course eventually stops 
communicating with the thyroid gland. So here with this scenario, the pituitary thyroid loop is permanently lost and the dependence on medication becomes lifelong. So another cause of hypothyroidism is an increase in thyroid binding globulin. And of course, that's the carrier protein for thyroid hormones to be delivered to cells. And usually estrogen is mainly the culprit. So when there's an increase in estrogen, you will generally see an increase in thyroid binding globulin. And of course, thyroid hormones in the bloodstream bind to excess TBGs. And of course, there's not enough free hormones available for cells. So another cause of hypothyroidism is nutritional deficiencies. Iodine and iron, selenium and magnesium are all needed for the conversion of thyroid. Zinc is critical for T3 production and copper prevents T4 overabsorption and it controls calcium levels. Vitamin A is involved in healthy thyroid receptors and vitamins B2, 6, 12, and C are all critical for thyroid production. And D3 helps against autoimmune-mediated thyroid dysfunction. So another major cause of hypothyroidism are endocrine disruptors that are in the environment. And this is a really good chart uh, showing the types of thyroid disruptors, the mechanism by which they disrupt the thyroid and their effects. So of course, there's nitrates and phthalates which they block the uptake of iodine into thyroid cells. So it basically decreases the synthesis of T3 and T4. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but I'm going to just run down some of the familiar ones. Methimazole is actually tapazole, which is an antithyroid agent. And it is actually a disruptor with soy isoflavones. Blocks the production of TPO, decreases, of course, the synthesis of T3 and T4. Um, we also have the PCSs, which is the polychlorinated biphenyls, uh, like in, in coolant fluids and carbonless copy paper, very, very carcinogenic. So competitive binds to thyroid transport protein, again, possible effect on fetal brain T4 production. There's red dye, number three, inhibits uh, deiodinase activity. So it decreases peripheral T3 synthesis. And you have your DDT, which is your insecticides. Um, it inhibits TSH receptors. So it decreases, of course, the production of T3 and T4. So now I kind of want to go over some root causes of thyroid autoimmune disease, and I'm going to start with the gut. So a gut that is ravaged by inflammation and infection tends to create chronic immune and stress response. And as a result, there is intestinal permeability, poor digestion, bacterial and parasitic infections. And these are very common digestive ailments that tend to lead to autoimmune disease. And of course, gluten intolerance. Uh, basically, with gluten, when the immune antibodies tag gluten for removal, they stimulate the production of antibodies against the thyroid gland as well, since they're both very similar in structure. So the immune response to gluten can last up to six months each time it's ingested. So gluten is very damaging to the gut wall. Heartburn or dysphagia can be presenting symptoms with Hashimoto thyroiditis due to esophageal motility disorder. And it's basically with heartburn, it's a burning sensation. And it's usually due to a poorly digested food rotting in your gut and shooting up into the esophagus and not necessarily from excess stomach acid. There's also abdominal discomfort and bloating that can occur due to bacterial overgrowth, like in SIBO, which is small intestinal bowel overgrowth. Reduced acid production can be due to autoimmune gastritis. Constipation slows down thyroid function. And symptoms usually resolve with proper support of the thyroid and removal of gluten is a must. So just a little bit about the intestinal microbiota. It is an endocrine network. And Hippocrates said that all diseases begin in the gut. And the lining of the digestive tract is a major immune barrier. 
So hence, poor gut health is a significant factor in triggering autoimmune diseases. And it is, the gut is the first and widest area of bacterial access. And it has the highest concentration of T cells in the human body. And the microbiome contributes 70% to the immune system. And it helps convert nutritional messages from intestinal lumen into endocrine signals. And it contains more than a thousand species, encoding 150 times more genes than are present in the human genome. So when there is intestinal barrier disruption, it always leads to immune activation. And here we've got on this side, the intact intestinal barrier. So with the healthy gut, there is a tightly woven mesh of tissues that doesn't allow the absorption of bacteria or harmful foods or undigested food particles into the bloodstream. So these junctures are very tight. And with chronic inflammation brought on by poor diet, and poor blood sugar control, chronic stress, it tends to loosen these junctures. So there tends to be holes so that harmful substances do get in, digested food particles, um, there could be bacteria. And so it enters the bloodstream. And this here is a compromised intestinal barrier or intestinal permeability. And once in the bloodstream, these particles are recognized as foreign invaders or antigens. And of course, the immune system attacks. And of course, this sets the stage for the development of autoimmune diseases like Hashimoto's. There are ways to support the gut. And the first is using a probiotic, preferably with a prebiotic, because the prebiotic is food for the probiotic. So it actually helps the probiotic to last longer. It is a very important part of restoring gut balance and clearing out bad bacteria and establishing, of course, healthier levels of good, healthy bacteria that's necessary for the conversion of T4 to T3. And uh, some of those strains would be lactobacilli and uh, bifidobacterium. The elimination diet is important because we need to avoid the trigger foods like gluten, dairy, processed foods, and sugar. Uh, reducing stress is a must using adaptogenic herbs, which are compounds that actually help to keep your cortisol at homeostasis. And with stress, gastric inflammation from dysbiosis or infection creates an alarm reaction, causing the adrenal glands to produce more cortisol. And of course, cortisol decreases the active T3 and increases your inactive T3, which is the reverse T3. And your nutritional compounds of A, D, and zinc all support gastric inflammation and in increases mucus formation and maintains a healthy gastric lining. And of course, fiber, aloe vera, and glutamine. And here is the wheel of nutritional needs in hypothyroidism, which a lot of them we've already gone through, but glutathione is critical because it actually helps with detoxification and that will help a sluggish liver. You've got choline and unfortunately with hypothyroidism, it does negatively affect choline. And so brain function declines. And also, of course, moodiness can occur. Lipoic acid, it does improve endothelial function and it protects thyroid cells from oxidative stress. When carnitine is low in either hypo or hyperthyroidism, it does contribute to muscle fatigue. Asparagine is the amino acid that's part of the structure of TSH and it regulates the communication with other hormones. So another potential functional root cause of thyroid autoimmune condition is stress. And so we're going to discuss the HPA axis. So here, over here, you've got the HPA axis, which is the hypothalamus, pituitary, and adrenal axis. And over on this side, you've got the hypothalamus, thyroid, a pituitary, and thyroid axis. And if you notice during times of high stress, what happens is the body does prefer to make more cortisol for survival. And so high enough 
amount of cortisol can actually suppress TSH and or prevent the conversion of T4 to active T3. And it can increase the amount of reverse T3, which is inactive. So you get no physiologic functioning in the cell. And while your body is in stress mode, your immune system is suppressed partially so that your body can focus on overcoming the stressor and partially because stress causes inflammation. So your immune system slows down to prevent a state of chronic inflammation. And a suppressed immune system can trigger latent viral infections, and some of which can trigger autoimmune thyroid disease. Some other negative effects on cor of cortisol on the thyroid include decreased TSH production, and of course, the reduction of thyroid hormone conversion from T4 to T3, increased reverse T3, decreased absorption of key nutrients, which we've discussed before. So here's the triad of autoimmunity. So you have basically environmental exposure to things like smoke, man-made chemicals, heavy metals, food intolerances, traumatic events. So that's all environmental. And then you have the genetic factor as well. And then you've got the internal imbalances where you've got the nutritional deficiencies, the infections, certain bacterial and, and viral infections like H. pylori, Epstein-Barr, and also there's hormonal in, imbalances, other parts of the endocrine and also hormone imbalances um, involving your sex hormones, high stress, and of course, your microbiome not being healthy. So what is Hashimoto's thyroiditis? It is caused by the immune system attacking the thyroid gland. And of course, then it becomes inflamed and becomes damaged. And as the damage progresses, the thyroid becomes increasingly unable to produce enough thyroid hormone. So Hashimoto's thyroiditis is also known as chronic lymphocytic thyroiditis, and it is named after a Japanese physician who worked in Europe before World War I, and he described the disease in a German publication in 1912, uh, and his name was Hakuro Hashimoto. Uh, it is an autoimmune disease. And uh, thyroid autoimmune diseases are the most common of autoimmune disorders, affecting about 7 to 8% of the U.S. population. And in the United States, autoimmune disease accounts for about 90% of adult hypothyroidism, and it's mostly due to Hashimoto's. And it can be caused by genetics and environmental factors. And the signs and symptoms do resemble those of hypothyroidism. And some individuals with Hashimoto's thyroiditis have normal thyroid function, particularly early in the course of the disease. So proper testing is important here to be able to identify this autoimmune insult. So these are some of the environmental disruptors that lead to Hashimoto's. And uh, some of these we've already discussed like uh, fluoride, lithium, bisphenol A, mercury. But with these environmental disruptors, they compete with iodine and they promote immune dysregulation, promote autoimmune response, activate the immune response, and of course, disrupt thyroid metabolism. Hashimoto's is considered the most prevalent autoimmune disorder in the United States. It has been found to be the mechanism for hypothyroid in 90% of cases in the U.S. And one study has found that up to 7 to 8% of the U.S. population have antibodies against their thyroid. And these thyroid antibodies have been found to be a marker for future thyroid disease. Some risk factors, usually signs uh, are apparent between the ages of 30 to 50. And it, it can occur in children, teens, and young women more prone to, it is more prone in women versus men. So research has shown a significant role of genetics in Hashimoto's. And of course, other autoimmune prone genes may trigger this condition as well. So causes of Hashimoto's, of course, the environmental exposure, excessive iodine intake through diet or supplementation, taking medications. Um, 
containing large amounts of iodine, which we talked about, amiodarone. Pregnancy, it's due to great hormonal changes in a woman's body, and thyroid dysfunction, of course, can occur after pregnancy. And statistically, about 20% of these women who have thyroid issues during pregnancy will develop thyroid issues in the future. And research has shown that being exposed to large amounts of radiation can also bring on these autoimmune diseases. And here is your great immune web for Hashimoto's. These are all the things that can contribute to this autoimmune condition that so many potentially have and don't even know it. So now we're moving on to hyperthyroidism or the or overactive thyroid. Of course, on this side, you've got your healthy thyroid and over here you've got an enlarged thyroid and these are common signs um, of overactive thyroid with the bulging eyes and the enlarged thyroid. So basically with hyperthyroidism, the thyroid gland just makes too much thyroid hormones. It is relatively rare. It only affects about 1% of people in the United States. Now, hyperthyroidism is also known as thyrotoxicosis, and some early symptoms are anxiety, nervousness, irritability, constipation, diarrhea, increased bowel movements, brittle nails. Now, the exophthalmia is the bulging eyes, and that's one of the hallmark signs. Heart palpitations, heat and cold intolerances, harder to manage diabetes, of course, a goiter and perspiring profusely. Some early symptoms continued. You, we've got le decreased libido, erectile dysfunction. We also have the Graves thyroid eye disease, which um, presents with eyelid retraction, puffy eyelids, reddening around the eyes, double vision, heart palpitations, muscle weakness, personality and psychological changes. Now, Onycholysis is the separation of nail from the nail bed, slight trembling of hands and fingers, and of course, weight changes. And they could have either loss or gain. Some late symptoms include hoarseness, menstrual disorders, puffy face, hands and feet, slow speech, reduced ability to hear. And there's also something called Graves dermopathy. So that's the lumpy thickening and reddening of the skin. And it's usually on the shins or the tops of the feet and the thinning eyebrow hair. Some causes of hyperthyroidism, of course, stress, physical, emotional, mental, exposure to environmental toxins, of course, excess dietary, iodine supplementation, existing autoimmune diseases, and of course, diet. Some other causes of hyperthyroidism include medications like, again, amiodarone, lithium, interferon alpha, uh, pregnancy or recent childbirth, thyroiditis, which is the inflammation of the thyroid gland, smoking, um, and of course, thyroid nodules, which is like the toxic adenoma, Plummer's disease. So now to Graves' disease, it is also known as diffuse toxic goiter and Flahani basidal Graves' disease. It is an autoimmune thyroid disease, and uh, actually the, the TRAB, which is a thyrotropin receptor antibody, can be used to diagnose it. And the, it's the body's immune system produces this, and it acts the same way as TSH does, but it stimulates the thyroid tissue to produce, to overproduce uh, T3 and T4. It is the most common form of thyrotoxicosis, five times more common in females than males. And the signs of Graves' disease usually presents between the ages of 20 to 40. And statistics strongly indicate that genetics plays a huge role in a person predisposed to Graves. A study done by Wood and Cooper showed a statistically significant trend for left-handed people to be affected by Graves' disease. And unlike other forms of hyperthyroidism, Graves can affect the tissues and muscles surrounding the eyes and the eye socket, inducing swelling and inflammation. So it's ophthalmopathy. And similar causes, signs and symptoms seen in hyperthyroidism. And here are some very common signs of graves with the bulging eyes where the eyelids retract and there's redness and that's thyroid eye disease. So it changes. It can be mild progressing to vision loss. Thyroid dermopathy is localized thickening of the skin and is commonly seen in the pretibial area. 
and that is ma mainly due to lymphocyte cytokine stimulation of fibroblasts. I want to talk a little bit about LDN or low-dose naltrexone. Naltrexone in 1984 FDA approved it for the management of drug addiction, and it is an opiate antagonist drug. But around the mid-80s, there was a New York doctor by the name of Dr. Bernard Bahari, and he was working with AIDS and cancer patients and discovered that low-dose naltrexone between 3 and 4.5 milligrams had beneficial effects on the immune system because it modulates the deregulation of the immune system with autoimmune disease and inhibits cancer cell growth to help control malignant disease. And since then, it's been used widely to treat symptoms of autoimmune disease, cancer, and other conditions that involve immune dysregulation. So how does LDN work in thyroid autoimmune conditions? Well, LDN has anti-inflammatory properties, and of course, with increased endorphin function, it does help to regulate the immune system. By decreasing inflammatory cytokines and interleukin activity, your interferon, and your transforming growth factor alpha, which are all inflammatory markers, LDN can improve thyroid function, both in the pituitary and in peripheral cells. These physiological mechanisms have been shown to further improve the conversion from T4 to T3, and it also helps to inhibit cells that cause the autoimmune process. So LDN regulates the immune system in a couple of ways. So first, it temporarily blocks the opioid receptors in the brain. And when the receptors are blocked, of course, the body thinks more opioids are needed. And so it makes more. And by the time more opioids are produced, LDN is out of the picture and the receptors are unblocked. And of course, this leads to a net increase in natural opioid production. Now, secondly, it regulates the immune system by promoting T regulatory cell function. So T regs, of course, keep the immune system in balance and they turn inflammation on and off depending on what's needed. So they essentially prevent the immune system from getting stuck in overdrive. Doses of uh, 1.5 to 5 milligrams per day is usually seen. And with those dosages, it looks like LDN really does help to prevent oxidative damage, regulate toll-like receptors, and of course, toll-like receptors or microglia. They are proteins that play a role in the innate immune system. And these TLR receptors are possibly associated with neuroinflammation. And so LDN regulates them to reduce or prevent this pro-inflammatory cascade. So LDN plays a big role in immune modulation. So some labs for thyroid evaluation, of course, a TSH, free T4, free T3, verse T3, iodine levels, of course, serum is best, thyroid antibodies, and the anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies, which is the uh, anti-TPO and thyroglobulin antibodies, TGAB. And of course, iron, which would be ferritin, TIBC, RBC, magnesium, and micronutrient testing would be very helpful to see what nutrients are deficient. And it's always so important to replete those specific micronutrients that are responsible for thyroid health. And this is a thyroid levels chart. So we've got the standard reference range and of course the optimal reference range, which is a little more functional. And these optimal reference ranges are where most people within these ranges feel their best. So here's a chart of uh, equivalent doses to the varying types of thyroid that is commercially available. You have armor and compounded T4, T3. You've got Nature Throid, Cytomel, which is your T3, and Synthroid, which is your T4. And here are some dosing recommendations and basically for 
levothyroid, it's 1.6 to 1.7 mics per keg per day. And your desiccated thyroid is approximately 4 to 1 ratio. Levothyroxine 100 mics is approximately 60 milligrams of desiccated thyroid. And here is a chart of thyroid, horm thyroid hormone replacement. So you've got brand names of Synthroid, Voxel, Unithroid, and that's basically the brand names like Tyrosint and Cytomel, which is T3. The advantage is, of course, consistent bioavailability, but it's not always cost-effective. Now, the Tyrosint should not have any fillers or dyes, but the others potentially do. Generic products of T4, like levothyroxine and liothyronine, it is more cost-effective, but unfortunately with generic products, bioavailability is not consistent between manufacturers. And of course, there are fillers and dyes that can create problems. And then you've got the desiccated thyroid hormones, which are made from animal-derived thyroid glands like porcine. You've got the armor, the NP thyroid, thyroid USP. Well, they come from a natural source, which is an advantage, but uh, not best for autoimmune thyroid because it does and can trigger autoantibodies. And unfortunately, um, availability of some of these brands may be limited at times. So conventional thyroid replacement, most of the commercial thyroid medications contain either a synthetic man-made hormone or a natural hormone, usually from pigs. And there are fixed dosages of thyroid products mass produced, and it can contain gluten, lactose, and dyes and other fillers, which can be problematic, especially if you already have dysbiosis, gut issues, and you're already having major inflammatory issues. And studies have shown that lactose and gluten affect the absorption of thyroid in many patients with Hashimoto's, irritable bowel syndrome, and celiac disease. And here's some dosage considerations. Um, so the half-life of T4 is longer, so you don't really need sustained release, but T3 has a much shorter half-life, so it should be dosed twice daily, so you can get that consistent bioavailability. And then with T3 options, it could it's available in immediate release or sustained release. So these are some things to think about with thyroid therapy. Thyroid medication should be taken on an empty stomach. So no food or vitamins for an hour prior to or after taking the medication. If there is adrenal dysfunction, it may be difficult tolerating thyroid replacement. And if there are adrenal issues, they really need to be addressed first because it may be difficult for thyroid patients to tolerate thyroid replacement if the adrenal issue is not addressed first. It is paramount to recheck thyroid levels in six weeks. Once optimal dosage been established, thyroid levels should be remeasured every six months. And of course, to remember to manage patient expectations. And these are some products that interfere with thyroid. And this is a nice chart that categorizes them. So these are some products that interfere with thyroid. And it's a great reference tool. There's a bunch of medications that alter thyroid function. And some of these medications increases clearance or lowers the absorption. And they're all right there for you. Compounded thyroid replacement, it can be any ratio of T4 to T3 because, again, this is customized medicine. It's not a fixed dose of four to one ratio and exact dosages can be done. You can use sustained release capsules, but not in persons with absorption issues. Top-notch compounding pharmacies will test the product for quality control. And these are some side effects of thyroid hormone therapy. So if you're getting too much, a lot of times you're going to see some nausea or tremors, diarrhea, heat intolerance, headache, weight changes, hair loss, tiredness, anxiety, and sweating. And there you have it. Thank you so much for your attention. Hopefully this was helpful and informative for you. And here are some references that hopefully will be of benefit uh, anytime that you have unanswered questions for thyroid. And please tune in to our next webinar coming soon.